Welcome everyone, Afrostorian here, bringing you myths and history from West Africa. Feel free to listen to this podcast while you go about your day, but I hope you find the stories interesting. This time, and for next episode, we are going to be focused on the Ivory Coast, or Côte d'Ivoire as it is also known. This particular episode will be featuring stories that come from the region. A lot of people from Ghana will likely notice how similar these stories are to their own myths. That is because Ivory Coast was also populated by a large number of Akan people just like in Ghana, so it is no surprise that a lot of the stories are similar. You will also note that all of these stories are origin tales in some way or form, as that's what I was able to find. So please enjoy these stories. Story number one. Why the monkey has small fingers. Long ago, all the maize in the world was hoarded by one being known as Egyakomu, or Father Monkey. If people wanted the maize, they would have to come to him. Komu didn't want money or riches. Rather, as payment, he had the people bow before him and let him punch them in the face at least once per basket of maize. One day, Egya Kadeba, or Father Spider, wanted to get some of that maize as well, but he had no desire to be punched. So, he snuck under his belly a strong earthen pot within his webs. When he joined the line, he made sure that no one could see what he was hiding. When it came for his time to be punched, Kadeba was able to swiftly put the pot on his head right before the fist hit his face, breaking Komu's fingers. Komu screamed and leapt out of his home, bounding amongst the trees, leaving the maze free for all the animals in the kingdom. Komu's hands did heal, but his fingers would never be large enough again to effectively punch people. Story number two. Why the lizard bobs its head. Kekele Bitile, the lizard, was starving for there was a famine throughout the land. He decided to venture beyond his home in order to find food, but the journey was so long that he started to become a former shell of himself. He finally found succor with the discovery of a coconut tree that actually had water-laden fruit. Excited, he rushed up the tree, but lost his grip once he almost made to the fruit and fell down on his head. Disoriented, he asked the earth goddess Azeleyaba what happened. She matter-of-factly told him that he had forever cracked his head and he would have to move it up and down just to get his bearings, which is why a lizard bobs his head before he makes a move. Story number three, the discovery of the Asonwu. On an island in a lagoon lived a man named Kofi near the land of the Anyi people and was renowned for being a famous crocodile hunter. He wouldn't sell these crocodiles, rather he saw them as prey and all he needed was his trusty spear. One day, his spear broke upon a crocodile's hide, and though he was able to still kill the crocodile, he needed to find a replacement. So, he managed to get a replacement from his friend Quao, and began another hunt. Spotting a massive crocodile, he thrust the new spear into it, but the iron shaft became stuck in the thick hide, and it broke off. The crocodile Recognizing the top predator of the lagoon, rushed back into the water with the iron shaft embedded in it. Disappointed, Kofi told Quao what had happened, and Quao was furious 
demanding that Kofi make him a new spear, exactly like the one that had been broken and lost. The two argued until the locals were tired of things and reported them to the village chief, who was also the village judge. The chief stated that the solution was simple. All that had to be done was for Kofi to fashion a new spear for Kwao, but Kwao was indignant and demanded the original spear be returned instead. The chief was scared of Kwao's outburst and then changed his ruling to reflect Kwao's desires, so Kofi had to find the spear tip, the same spear tip that was currently underwater at the bottom of a lagoon. So, since the crocodile was hiding at the bottom of a lagoon, how the heck was Kofi, a human that needed air to breathe, supposed to get it? However, Kofi was not going to disobey the orders of the chief, no matter how ridiculous the order. So, Kofi went to the beach. Kofi's own family followed him to the shores of the lagoon and even prepared a preemptive funeral because they were all sure he was going to die because, you know, drowning. So Kofi readied himself and walked into the lagoon until he was fully submersed. His family left the shores, understandably believing him to be dead. Three months later, a young boy saw Kofi, very much alive, walk out of the lagoon. The boy ran to the village to tell everyone just before Kofi, dripping with water, walked into the chieftain's hall with the missing spear tip in his hand. The villagers were happy to see him, but they wondered how he had managed to survive for three months underwater. Kofi told them that there was actually a small town underneath the lagoon full of people. These were the Asanwu, a race of mermaid-like creatures with the ability to take the shape of any waterborne animal, and they liked to appear like larger forms of the creatures of the lagoon. When Kofi met the Asanwu, they gave Kofi the ability to breathe underwater and gave him lots of food. When Kofi met the chief of the Asanwu, the chief told him that the giant crocodile he had fought wasn't a true crocodile, but his chief military officer, who had taken the form of one, because he had heard tales from the native crocodiles of a great hunter from the land that didn't need a net. So he wanted to see this hunter for himself. The chief stated that he could have the spear tip back, but he would have to wait for the spear to be naturally pushed out by the military officer's steel healing flesh, which would take about three months. Kofi agreed and stayed with the Asanwu, learning about their culture, their traditions, and some of their secrets. They gifted him a bead to be worn around his neck, and told him that if the people of the village made sacrifices of animals to them every year, that any child that fell ill would immediately be cured of sickness. So the village was very happy with this news, and decided to worship the Asanwu. Here is where things take an extremely dark turn. Kofi gave his niece, Ayuba, the bead, and she met up with Kwao's niece, Ama. Ama was eight months pregnant and was Ayuba's best friend. While they were doing laundry together, the bead suddenly snapped off Ayuba's necklace and dropped into the water. Aguba despaired, but Ama, being a good friend, dug into the ground beneath the waves to get her friend's bead. She eventually managed to find the bead after digging for a while and brought it back up, but it was filthy. Ama proceeded to clean the bead, and when it came time to blow off the last specks of dust off the Asanwu bead, it accidentally fell into her throat. Ama was despondent and Aguba assured her that everything would be fine. So she went and told her uncle Kofi what happened, thinking that he would have a good way to solve the problem. Spoilers, he didn't. 
Kofi was angry that his precious bead was gone, and demanded that the bead be retrieved. Ayuba pointed out that what he was asking couldn't be done. Ama had already swallowed it, but Kofi had an evil thought and schemed of an opportunity to repay back all the suffering he had received because of Quao. So, just like Quao had done to him, Kofi was now calling on the chief of the village for a verdict. Quao offered to fashion Kofi a bead similar to the one that was lost. Kofi, angered by this double standard, told the chief that he was going to cut open Ama in order to get the bead, and the chief actually allowed this. With glee, Kofi sliced open Ama's pregnant belly and pulled out the children, then cut open her stomach, but the bead was nowhere to be found. He then slashed Amar's neck, and the bead fell out. Pleased, he ignored the now dead Amar and her two children, and went home. And that's how the story actually ends. I'm honestly not sure what the lesson in the story was, but let's move on to a more light-hearted story. Story number four. Wisdom Comes to the World This story might be familiar to those knowledgeable of the tales of Ananti the Spider. It begins as such. Long ago, there was no wisdom in the land. Egya Kedeba, known as Father Spider, learned that Nana Nyan Mele, the creator god, was storing all the wisdom at his home in clay pots. Kedeba then set on a three-day journey to Nyanmele's house, and upon arriving at his home, gave him a formal presentation which impressed Nyanmele. Nyanmele then gave him one pot of wisdom. On Kedeba's way home with the pot, a fallen tree blocked his path, and he wondered how to deal with the situation. Wanting to see how high the fallen trunk actually was, he put the pot on the trunk and climbed on top of it, but the actions caused the pot to roll off and split apart, with the contents of the pot spilling into the earth. Thus wisdom came into the world, though it is not something everyone has. Well, that's all the stories I could find, the ones that were in English anyway, unless you want me to recount the stories entirely in French. But. We won't be leaving the Ivory Coast just yet. Next episode, we will be looking at some of the kingdoms that existed in the Ivory Coast, since the history there is a bit sporadic. So I hope you enjoyed this. Afrostorian, out.